Hi everyone. And today we have a guest speaker in this class, and this is indeed the Geography 1310, Globalization and the Developing World. But at the same time, this is Wealth and Poverty public lecture this semester. So we are glad to have Dr. Bill Kelly from Yale University. Dr. Kelly is a professor of anthropology and Sumitomo professor of Japanese studies at Yale University. In 2009, Dr. Kelly was awarded the Order of the Rising Sun, Global Rage with <laughs> Net Ribbon by the Japanese <laughs> government. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not worried. This is, a, this is only a microphone. It's not a <laughs> <laughs> that has to be one of the most prestigious ribbons given by the Japanese government. Somewhat embarrassing, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Later this year, the University of California Press uh, will publish his book, The Sports World of the Hanshin Tigers, a professional baseball in modern Japan. And his visit to Ohio University is co-sponsored with the Japan-US Friendship Commission and the Northeast Asia Council of the Asia Association for Asian Studies, as well as Ohio University's Asian Studies, Linguistics Department, and the Western Poverty theme. So without further ado, I will let you hear from Dr. Kelly. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, and good morning to uh, all of you. I'm sorry for the travel complications yesterday, but uh, happy to be able to come into the class of some of you. I guess there are others from outside the class. I want to talk today about sports, which actually doesn't directly relate to your syllabus on globalization and developing countries or wealth and inequality, although it does, of course, indirectly. but. That's not really the direction in which I want to push the topic today. My starting point is very straightforward, which is that for many of us, playing sports for all of its potentials and problems is deeply rewarding. And watching sports and following sports is also deeply rewarding. What we less appreciate is that sports are also rewarding to think about. The sports bring up all sorts of issues, whether you're a sports fan or not, you know, that help us to understand many of the key debates and dilemmas in life more generally. Sports are good to think about, and there are books and books and books that have taken the topic in this way. Now, this is February, and it's February, but it's a busy sports month, no matter where you look. Nationally, we're in the middle of the NBA, uh, NBA season, College basketball, we're working towards March Madness. Hockey, NHL hockey is in the middle of its season. Major League Baseball opened its spring training camps last week. Of course, the mega event of the month was the NFL, the Super Bowl, Minneapolis, at the, at the beginning of the month. I'm an East Asianist. I'm here to talk about East Asia. So I want to focus on the other mega event um, of the month, which were the Winter Olympics that just concluded um, in South Korea um, last uh, Sunday. Just out of curiosity, how many of you watched the Super Bowl? That's pretty good. How many of you watched any of the Winter Olympics? I, I don't mean just you went through your dorm room and the TV was on, but sort of sat down and a couple of times actually watched the events. Is that right? Well, that's impressive. That's impressive. Um, and in taking up the Olympics, my particular question is the relationship between the Olympics, not just these Olympics, but the Olympic movement and East Asia. And I want to go both ways. When I think about what the Olympics and the Olympic movements have meant to East Asia and for East Asia and its countries, South Korea, North Korea, China, Japan, particularly Taiwan, Hong Kong, but also what East Asia has meant for the Olympic movement um, as, a, 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 as a world uh, a movement. And just to give you a roadmap of the next 40 minutes or so, I really want to approach this in three sets of issues, three sets of topics. And first, to think about the Olympics themselves and why they are so 
productive and so fascinating to think about um, as a fairly unique way of doing and watching sports um, in the world. Um, and then sort of survey very briefly what turns out to be a very long engagement that the East Asian countries have had with the Olympic movement that started back in the 1890s. So we're talking about 120 years of history for the Olympics and about 100 years of history of East Asia being involved um, in the Olympics. And then I want to come to this question of, or these really two questions, this two-sided question of what the Olympics means for East Asia and to turn it around what East Asia means uh, for the Olympics. But first, let's think about the Olympics themselves. I mean, they're quite distinct. They're quite, I mean, it, they're quite different than the Super Bowl in Minneapolis three weeks before. First of all, the Summer and Winter Olympics are unique multi-sport platform. You know, March Madness is all about basketball. You know, the World Series is about baseball. It draws baseball fans. You go to baseball, you watch the World Series, you know baseball. You follow these teams. When you sit down to watch the World Series, you know and you care on one side or another. But when you go to the Olympics, when you turn on the TV, you know, there are, what, 28 sports in the Summer Olympics, and each of those sports has multiple events. You know, most of us don't have a clue as to the rules of these sports, let alone the players who are involved. And so a multi-sport sort of venue has sort of a distinctive problem in trying to attract an audience and trying to bring participants and spectators and sponsors uh, together. Um, they have to create the characters. They have to, inf you know, in, in order to care about something, you have to know about something. If you don't know about something, it's really hard to get involved. You can watch and, and you know, it's sort of bobsledding and it's sort of fun for 30 seconds, but you don't know what's going on. You don't know why one has won over the other. You don't even know who the teams are. So a lot of what is involved in the Olympics that's not involved in many other major sports is we have to be drawn in to care about something by knowing. So the, a lot of the Olympics is in getting us to know something about the figures, picking out characters um, who are profiled, whose stories are, are, are presented to us, put before us, creating rivalries that we didn't even know existed, um, trying to get us to understand um, why one sport you know, works the way it sports, the technology of it, the rules of it, um, what is competitive about it, um, and so on. So the Olympics are unusual in sort of, in, in, in sort of showing us what it takes to get involved in sports. Um, and Johnny Weir, a really weird but sort of popular commentator, I mean, he had it right. It's the best reality TV show going on. That's what they wanted, to, that's how they wanted to, to, to think about it. Uh, the other, um, the other uh, 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 consequence of a multi-sport platform is it sort of, it gets you to think about what a sport is. You, know, you have all of these sports side by side, and it sort of gets you, well, what really is a sport? I mean, ice hockey is a sport, but is curling a sport? And so what is a sport anyway, if curling and ice hockey can be side by side? So in lots of ways, this multi-sport platform brings to the surface um, the issues of, of how we construct sports, how we get um, engaged in sports. Um, a second distinctive feature of the Olympics is that it is a rare moment of almost equal exposure for male and female athletes. It wasn't always that way. Um, in the beginning, the Olympics, like almost all sports, excluded, specifically, explicitly, excluded women from participation and certainly didn't welcome even their spectatorship in the stadiums um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. But in fact, over time, as you can see from this graph, the Olympics have been the major engine in the world for bringing women a certain amount of resource and exposure and recognition as elite athletes. Because it puts side by side male and female sports and events, because it's the same gold medal that a female athlete is going to win and a male athlete is going to win, so countries vying for medals realize they have to put effort into drawing out their, their, their female athletes. Um, it hasn't 
certainly quite uh, realized parody even in the Olympics. Um, ski jumping was a, a minor controversy in the Winter Olympics, one of the last of the sports to allow women to participate. I mean, it goes back to the early 20th century when uh, Baron de Coubertin and the, the people that set up the Olympics you know, really felt that it just was not uh, ladylike for women to show their athletic bodies in public. Um, the sight of the ruffled hair as they fell was, was unsettling. I mean, the language is, is, is very quaint, but it continued into the 21st century. Um, they finally allowed women's uh, uh, ski jumping um, in the early 21st century, but the president of the Ski Jumping Federation, even in 2015, said, no, I really, I don't think it's right from a medical point of view that women should be allowed to fly off the hills, which prompted, I thought, the best retort um, to that attitude by Lindsey Vann, not, not Vaughn, but Lindsey Vann was our premier ski jumper at the time, who or looked at him and said, look, you're worried about the, don't worry about us. We women have our, our baby making organs on the inside. Um, and <clears throat> although women are still denied the highest hills, probably in five or 10 years, probably by Beijing or beyond, um, there will be parity as well. So this, this question of, of, of gender equity, we only find um, in the Olympics. Also, <laughs> I mean, as that remark suggested, the Olympics sort of bring out in so many different ways because there's so many different sports, a lot of our deepest anxieties about things far beyond sports, um, about fairness and cheating, all the doping scandals. Um, what constitutes sort of gen body modification that is reasonable and fair and healthy and what doesn't? Um, questions about gender, you know, for decades there have been the tests that have, have uh, to determine who is a male and who is a female athlete, mostly to determine who is a female athlete, um, and test after test from the physiographic to the endocrinological has proven to be faulty. I mean, the Olympics have been a place where we have debated the nature of and the definitions of gender and sex um, for at least the last 60 years. Um, we've debated issues of, you know, where does the body end and technology begin? I mean, what is a natural body? What is, the, what is an abled body and a disabled body? In all sorts of ways, the Olympics, because of the way they are set up and because of the, the world frame that they have, um, are a platform for drawing out um, what are some of the most sort of anxious um, uh, debates that we have socially, uh, uh, philosophically, um, and, and, and ethically. It's also an extraordinary example of global governance. Beginnings were quite inauspicious. You know, that's a, a group of white men sitting around a table in 1894, the first meeting of a couple of Euro uh, two Americans and a couple of Europeans who were trying to revive the lofty ideals of the ancient Greek, Greek Olympics um, in order to create a platform for sportsmanship and peace among what they thought were the European nations and the US. But very quickly, their ambitions became much broader and they started to invite to try to draw in other areas of the world. And by the mid 20th century, um, the IOC, it's the International Olympic Committee, but actually that is deeply misleading. It is not international. Um, it is beyond the nation state system that is international politics. It is a global governance structure. It's hard to, impossible to read their complicated diagram of all of the councils and commissions and assemblies and executives um, and commercial uh, arms that now constitute the IOC. But it is one of the most complex global governance networks in the world. Now, people want to study globalization, say, well, study Starbucks or McDonald's or Nike. No, if you really want to understand globalization and globalization government, study the IOC. Because they not only have the organization, they, have, they control their own intellectual property rights, they have their own court system, they have their own legislative body, they have their own code of ethics, their own code of conduct, their own commercial code. When the IOC comes to town, its laws rule 
Rio or Tokyo or Pyeongchang. I mean, it, is, it has set itself up as, a, 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 as a world apart um, from the international order um, of, of nation states. So as a global governance organization, it's also quite, it's also quite um, distinctive. Uh, it decides its own citizenship. You know, in, in the Rio games, Italy wanted to send a baseball team. It sent 24 members of the baseball team. Only six of them were from Italy. The others were Americans and Canadians, whose, one of whose parents or grandparents was of Italian descent. So they were Italian, American, Italian community. But for the Olympics purposes, they were Italian baseball citizens. There's a whole notion of citizenship that the IOC has created um, along its own lines by its own jurisdiction, its own, its own, adju its own adjudication. And the final point is sort of distinctive is, is, is Olympic time. Now for us, Olympics begin when opening ceremonies, maybe we turn on the TV, we watch the opening ceremony. It ends, um, if we've lasted that long, closing ceremony 10 days, 12 days later when we want to get back to basketball. It can be even shorter for an athlete. The Olympics can be over in a matter of seconds, as they were for Nathan Chen. You know, trained for four years, shows up, first jump, falls. His Olympics are gone. I mean, his Olympics lasted about 10 seconds, or the skaters make the first turn. Actually, though, Olympic time is a long, long time. And this is what gets to be important in understanding its effects socially and politically and economically. The Pyeongchang Olympics started about 12 years ago when various sites in South Korea wanted to host one of these games. And there was this struggle, but the struggle meant that you had to get your political, your local political interests in order, your local economic resources in order. You had to come up with a plan. Planning for the Olympics is at least a decade long process, a highly competitive process, process that requires, say, lots of political and economic mobilization at the local level, at the national level, at the lobbying, the IOC at the, at, at the global uh, level as well. Then once you're designated as the would-be host, you have a number of years of intensive sort of infrastructure building. You have to create not just the venues, but also the design plans and the aesthetic motifs. You have to create an Olympic education program. You have to start training a population to serve as the hosts for the visitors. You have to negotiate broadcast. This is a very intensive multi-year project in order to get to those opening ceremonies. And then there's the games, the, the, the two weeks which is just sort of a flash for those who have been involved. And when they extinguish the flame, it's not over. You know, then you have to not only sort of do the wrap up and the reports, but you have the legacy of that Olympics that can stretch for decades, trying to create that legacy, trying to massage that legacy, trying to spin that legacy. You know, the Tokyo 1964 Olympics are still going on. They're still important. In, in, in collective memory, they're still important in the political messaging of the Japanese government, and now they're coming back um, as a kind of precursor to Tokyo 2020. So Olympic time is actually a process that begins at least a decade before those two weeks and can last. We're still talking about Montreal. We're still talking about the Berlin Nazi Olympics in 1936 that can last for, last for, a, long, long, for a long, long time. <clears throat> okay, let me just talk very briefly, just to remind, or not, well, to remind me to, 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 to communicate the, actually the, the historical depth that East Asia has within Olympics that, as I said, began at that table as a very Euro-American, sort of patronizing, certainly male androcentric kind of a notion, but turned into something that uh, even uh, Baron de Coubertin himself couldn't, uh, couldn't imagine. Um, Japan was the first, or actually really non-Euro-American country to uh, start coming into the Olympics. Uh, this uh, fellow here, Kano Jiro, was actually the guy who codified judo in Japan, late 19th century. And judo in Japan, karate in, in, in Okinawa and South Korea, the, 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 sort of the, Jap the uh, East Asian martial arts began, then started to circulate um, into Europe, into South America, um, came up to LA more recently, became mixed martial. I mean, just the, the globalization, the global flows of 
East Asian martial arts are their own sort of fascinating topic, but he also was the one who started the Olympic interest in the Olympic organizations in Japan, which then spread to um, Korea uh, and, 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 uh, and, and China. Um, by the 1920s and the 1930s, Japan particularly realized that the Olympics might be a place where they could get some exposure um, and some recognition from their fellow imperial powers. Um, Japan had colonized um, parts of East Asia, Southeast Asia, into the Pacific, um, and it felt it needed to be recognized by European powers who had their own imperial interest, and the Olympics were a place they could send their athletes to. 1930s, 1932, they I mean, literally made a splash with their swimming team in 1932 in LA, um, which gained them um, the opportunity to host the 1940 Olympics in Tokyo, um, following these uh, notorious 1936 Olympics that Adolf Hitler um, uh, 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 produced in Berlin in 1936. Uh, World War II broke out, the 1940 Olympics were canceled, um, as were the 1944, but after the war, um, after World War II, um, as the Cold War divided the globe into this first and second world um, of the U.S. And, 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 and Europe and NATO um, and Russia, Japan was anxious to demonstrate its allegiance to the first world, was anxious to demonstrate that it had moved from military prowess to economic growth and economic power um, and hosted the first Asian Olympics in 1964 in Tokyo. Um, at the same time, East Asia was involved because China wanted to get involved in the Olympic movement, but who was to represent China, um, mainland or Taiwan? Um, this was, as, as this suggests, the, the protest that the Taiwanese did. So that the Olympics became um, a, a platform for having to make some very contentious decisions about who was China, uh, was Japan to be um, admitted back into uh, normal nations um, in the 1950s, in, in, the, 19, in the 1960s? Um, from 1964 on, I mean, the games turned out to be a resounding success. I mean, one of the things that the games introduced was a new attention to sort of the aesthetics of the, I mean, the design of the posters, um, the design of the ideographs for the events um, were particularly noticeable uh, to, the, to the rest of the world. Um, the architecture um, of the stadiums sort of introduced a whole generation of international architects from Japan to the world. So that this really became a way in, I mean, coming out party was the term that was used to describe the reception of Japan um, by the rest of the world through, um, the, use of the, through the use of those Olympics. Um, Japan did a, a Winter Olympics in 1972, but it was really when South Korea, by the 1980s, um, a, a, a gaining economic strength following Japan, uh, the Asian Knicks that you talk about in your class, the flying geese formation flying behind uh, uh, Japan as a model of regional growth, regional uh, relations, regional rivalries. Um, Korea saw the uh, Summer Olympics as a way of trying to emulate um, the Japanese model um, and had an equally successful um, Seoul Olympics, um, which brings us to, you know, by the 1990s into the present century, essentially the East Asian, if not monopoly, at least the East Asian um, enthusiasm for taking over sponsorship and hosting of both the summer and winter Olympics. Um, and from Beijing through this month's Pyeongchang to the upcoming Tokyo to Beijing uh, wanting to take on a, a Winter Olympics uh, for the first time in 2022, um, you have let's say, a, a long history of increasing involvement from the margins um, to the center. So let me turn to this, come back to this original question about the East Asian and, 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 and the Olympic uh, movement. Is in hindsight, the Olympics may well not have survived into the 21st century without East Asia stepping up and stepping in. I mean, yeah, there would be Olympics, but it's hard to imagine without the corporate sponsorship, 
without the broadcasting revenue and audiences, without the willingness to host at the scale with which East Asian nations have been willing to um, host over the last 20 years, it's hard to imagine that the IOC and the Olympic movement could remain at the scale of, of, of profitability and visibility um, without um, the East Asians and the East Asian countries um, actually having, having taken over um, a central role um, in, 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 in their production. I mean, historians talk about counterfactuals. You know, what, what if such and such would have happened but didn't happen? So it's really hard to tell, but it is a kind of a counterfactual. But I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the East Asian uh, 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 participation, the East Asian leadership in the Olympic movement has kept the Olympics alive at the vitality um, that, we, that, we still, that we still see them today. The other side of the coin is harder to assess. That is, are the Olympics really of much consequence to the geopolitics and to the regional economy um, to the life conditions of the countries of East Asia. Now, there's certainly a number of trouble spots in the world um, that gravely endanger all of us. And you can be talking about the Middle East or Afghanistan or South Sudan or Ukraine. It's hard to come up with sort of a list of the, the, the scale of danger, but certainly East Asia is on any of those lists. Chinese-Japanese relations are probably in their worst place um, since the immediate post-World War II years. As all of you know, the tensions um, in the Korean Peninsula, um, led by Kim Il-jung's sort of nuclear threats, are higher than they have been since the 1950s between the two Koreas, but also directly involving China and Japan and the United States and the United States role and resolve in the region are probably at their most vulnerable, their most fragile um, in the decades as well. I mean, we often talk about what happens if a nuclear a North Korean warhead you know, is aimed at Honolulu or, or Seattle or Los Angeles. That's probably much less likely than a nuclear warhead makes its way across the Sea of Japan. It's only 700 miles to the wounded nuclear power plant in Fukushima, 75 miles from Tokyo, the resulting conflagration would change the course of human history instantaneously. So there are all sorts of really scary scenarios that are not entirely unrealistic. So the question is, can the Olympics possibly mean anything geopolitically at such a fraught moment? That was certainly one of the media themes this month in Pyeongchang. And so we had you know, President Moon, who was trying for, for, for a long time to get North Korea and South Korea together, saw the Olympics as this opportunity. Um, and um, you know, Mike Pence and his wife and, and, and Kim Il-jung's uh, uh, sister um, show up at the opening ceremonies, Ivanka Trump at the club. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which he was trying to make the Olympics work um, at a moment, at a, at, at, a, at a moment like this, probably to very little effect. I mean, the short answer is no, I think. The Olympics really don't have a lot of leverage, a lot of possibility um, in moments like this. But a longer answer, I think, to the question of the Olympic significance um, to these countries or to any country, you know, we'd have to get us thinking about at least three different levels. The effect on the national level, the effect on the regional level, like East Asia, the effect on, 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 on the global level. And on the national level, the Olympics effects have been in East Asia profound, transformative for every single Olympic. And just to give you two very brief examples, 1964 Tokyo has nothing to do with sports. But a week before the Tokyo Olympics opened, um, the famous bullet train construction was completed. This is the first bullet train leaving Tokyo Station. As part of the whole infrastructure was the, I mean, railroads have been in Japan for 80 years. But this bullet train unintentionally 
transformed the transportation network in Japan. It all of a sudden made Tokyo the single hub of the main transportation medium, the railroads, um, in Japan. Now you go to Japan now, any train you take, it's either the up train or the down train. Any train going to Tokyo is the up train. Any train leaving from Tokyo, no matter which direction it's going, is the down train. Tokyo has become not solely the result of the 64 Olympics, but, but, but it's been powerfully motivated to become the hyper-concentrated single center of Japan. It has deformed um, the Japanese political and social landscape for that fact. But it was really the Olympics and what the Olympics set in motion in 1964 that went a long way to creating the shape of Japan, sort of geographically and politically um, and socially um, that we see today. Something similar happened in Korea, South Korea, in the 1980s. The Olympics became this way of, of redeveloping the entire Seoul capital region, following the Japanese model. But it also took a completely unintended political, a political course. Um, the Olympic bid was done by the military dictator in the late 1970s. Um, and it was meant to confirm and affirm his autocratic control over South Korea by the world of nations. Well, protests developed through the 1980s. Students, labor, citizen, regional protests culminating in massive strikes and demonstrations in 1987 that actually produced the first democratic polity in Korea. The, the, and, and it was because of the Olympics, the pressure of the Olympics, the prestige of the Olympics actually got rid of the military dictatorship and produced a democracy, which was exactly the opposite of what was intended by, 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 the, by the initial bit. Uh, so a, a lot happens. I mean, these are one of, of tens of examples one can give of the importance at the, at, at the national level. At the global level as well, the Olympics have been enormously important to East Asia for reasons that I've already suggested. They have seen this as a way of demonstrating to the rest of the world their capacities for putting on not just efficient, but exciting and aesthetically uh, a beautiful ceremonies and performances and rituals, all the things that the Olympics enable um, and demand. And you know, there are lots of media studies and other sort of analyses of different Olympics. And always, the East Asia Olympics appear as sort of the most well-received Olympics by the larger global community, quite apart from sports fans themselves. So at the global level as well, um, the Olympics have been um, uh, uh, quite valuable for, um, for the, uh, the East Asia countries. But finally, let's return to the regional level. I mean, East Asia has gone all out on the Olympic Games and the Olympic movement, starting in the 21st century. The Olympics have not brought peace and mutual understanding, despite the lofty rhetoric of, of the Olympics themselves. Um, they haven't been effective vehicles for um, regional diplomacy, despite President Moon's efforts to make that the case now. But the Olympics have provided um, a field of regional rivalry and competition among the four main countries that has never been seen in any other world region. That's the impact the Olympics have had on the East Asia um, as a region. Now, some might reasonably argue that it's better for those four nations to compete on out-hosting one another at sporting events rather than attacking one another at shooting events. But it isn't an either or situation. That is, the Olympics, have, the Olympics have, little, have had little to do with mediating the intense antagonisms that have characterized the East Asia geopolitical scene for a century or more. But they have provided sort of a tempting and highly visible platform for the competition for national prestige that the games now represent for these nations as they try to emulate and exceed one another. That is, the Olympics are the premier geopolitical sport for East Asia. 
So in, in, in summary, I've been reflecting on this two-sided question of the Olympics. It's several quite distinctive features that, that really provoke us in all sorts of ways beyond um, the, the, the themes of this particular presentation. Um, and East Asia, which presently contains so much of the world's dynamism, but also so much of the world's a danger. <clears throat> and as I claimed at the outset, sports are rewarding to play, sports are rewarding to watch, but what I really hope I've succeeded in trying to show you is how sports might also be rewarding to think about and to ponder. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
participants in American teams, and then you make us know about them. We didn't know about them. You make us care about them because they're American. And then Nathan Chen falls, you know, in the first 10 seconds. So what are we left with? And what is NBC left with? So there's this sort of double-edged sort of pressure on the networks to build up to make us, that's the hook we care about, the American athletes. But they, they, they sometimes, Michaela Schifrin, you know, we were expecting her to win five gold medals. She barely limped through with a gold and a silver. And that was very disappointing given the expectations. It wasn't, you know, that's the way sports are. But we don't look at them as normal sports. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for a very thoughtful presentation. I, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about the upcoming Tokyo Olympics. As you know, Prime Minister Abe has put a lot of sort of capital into this and dressing up the Super Mario and trying to <coughs> kind of you know, hype, up the, hype up the attention. But, right. Um, you mentioned the Tokyo Olympics of 64 and, and this coming one. There are many parallels, but there are also a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. Uh, Japan was growing really fast in 64. Everyone thought they were a middle class citizen, but now it's deflation. Right. Um, and there's a lot of social inequality. And so I'm wondering, you know, for the 2020 Olympics, what will be the legacy given these differences? Mm -hmm. Will it be different for people in Osaka, for example, than it would be for people in Tokyo or mm -hmm. in, in, in different regions? Right. Yeah, no, I mean, the, you, you'll see the 2020 Tokyo Olympics probably even broadcast even more widely than the 2018. And, and you're right, they're trying very hard to tie the legacy of 64 to the promise of 2020, but it is very different. And one of the differences, as, as many of you know, you know, 2011, there was the tsunami and the, the nuclear disaster, which is still ongoing and unresolved, that has cost you know, the Japanese government, the Japanese citizens, just enormous sort of resources. But they started bidding for these Olympics back in 2006, 2007. They wanted 2016. They had a big campaign and they lost out to Rio, but that set them up for 2020. So this has been going on even before 2011. 2011 happened and it has, you know, it diverted the financial resources, the attention, the concern. You know, it, it was a much more important agenda than putting on an Olympics, but they were in this process. So the, 20, this, the real shadow of the 2020 Olympics is not so much the 1964 Olympics, but the 311, the 2011 ongoing, still unresolved um, difficulties. Now, the difference is that that happened up in Tohoku, you know, up in the rural Northeast. And once we send the aid, you know, then we can pull back and put all of our resources in it. The thing is, Tokyo doesn't need all of this attention. Tokyo doesn't need all of this money. So it's actually, despite the prime minister's efforts to make it sort of a national prestige um, and recalling the great uh, legacy of 64, there is enormous uh, concern um, in Japan particularly outside of Tokyo, or even within Tokyo, for what it's going to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, so you, know, you mentioned the Nazi Olympics, 1936. Uh, yeah, that was a big geopolitical thing. Right. So you know, apparently we're going to trade war with China. It's easy to win. But so do you think that the Olympics right now are big enough stage, let's say you know, we had like Beijing Olympics next year or something, mm -hmm. that those type of political issues could get expressed in the Olympics? You think it's like that part of the stage? Well, I mean, again, another of the fascinating things about the Olympics, it's like sports. You know, you can set things up, and you think you know the two teams and how they've done with each other over the years, and every, but you never know the result. I mean, you know, even, even the underdogs win sometime. Or, you know, I mean, sports are this amazing thing that completely rule governed and framed and set up. But then once it starts, you're not really sure of the outcome. The same with the Olympics. I mean, you, you can start 12 years before, you know, to plan these Olympics. And yet, you know, something can happen at the games 
You know, and you know, the thing about Pyongyang, I mean, the real drama was not the drama on the, on the, on the ski jump and the real drama on the hockey rink. The real drama was whether there was going to be some kind of terrorist action or you know, some effort to disrupt the Olympics. So the same could be said about, you know, what if there was, a, you know, Beijing 2022 or, or, or Tokyo? I mean, you know, what if the nuclear warhead, you know, comes over the opening ceremony? I mean, there are all sorts of, of what ifs that make people that want to do this, like leaders, pretty nervous, I think, at night about no matter how much, how many decades, a decade of planning can be overturned with, you know, a single unexpected, unexpected event. It's unlikely. I mean, these Olympics came and went and it seemed to, if not solve anything, at least it was a temporary reprieve in the normal news about Rocket Man and the like. But we're back to you know, diplomacy or the lack of diplomacy as usual. And that would probably would happen in your scenario, but you don't know. Uh, well, I don't know, you, I'll let you handle the time and everything. I, Do you think the Olympics will ever move from the host city format to having a permanent facility? What will the timing and planning it takes just to go into it, changing it? Well, that would make for a very different Olympics and probably, probably a more stable. You know, there's a, there's a, there, there have been for a long time a proposal, let's go back to, to, to Greece, and let's go back to Olympus, let's set up a permanent o Olympic games facility that everybody can contribute to financially that gives a sort of stability, it's like Wimbledon um, or the Masters. Uh, and in lots of ways that may be a, 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 the most rational solution. Um, there hasn't been a lot of interest in that. So where would it be? You know, as they say, the Olympics for East Asia, at least over the last couple of decades, has hosting the Olympics. It's not just winning gold medals at the Olympics. I mean, it is for athletes and it is for some countries, but the Olympics are a lot more. So you want to host, you want to be able to host the Olympics, you want to be, create and Olympics that will be memorable in its own distinctive way, and that would not be possible with that plan. So it would, it would change the Olympic, you know, personally, probably in a better way, but politically, probably unlikely. Now, some say, well, the, you know, the Winter Olympics, global warming, it's harder to find reliable locations for Winter Olympics, particularly because they don't have the, the profitability. So maybe, at least for the Winter Olympics, we should Designate a site. Well, you designate a site in 20 years. It's tropical. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to anticipate political conditions and environmental conditions to say for the 21st century this is going to be the Olympic venue. So, I, as I say, it's it, it's a fast. It, it's beyond speculation. People are actively debate, debating it, but at least through the 2020s, that's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Um, with the Winter Olympics in Beijing in 2022, will they reuse some of the facilities they used in 20, er, 2008? Well, that's what they say. I mean, in fact, Tokyo in 2020 says it's going to reuse some of the facilities from 19, or going to upgrade them. And, up, and to a certain extent they have, but it turns out their original promises are not quite, you know, they, they actually end up building new things and Beijing may be the same way because some of the buildings like the swimming cube and all, I don't know to what extent you can repurpose that for indoor events, but that's part of the plan. I mean, because that's interesting because in, you know, over the last 20 years, sustainability, economic sustainability and environmental footprint, environmental impact have become important sort of idea, policy uh, uh, objectives, demands uh, from the Olympics. Uh, and so the, the, the would-be hosts have to promise. Well, most of these promises are never kept, but it becomes part of the case that you make, that you have to, to think about things like reusing facilities and uh, uh, downscaling the facilities and the, the impact on, on the environment. So they become political, economic, and environmental in their rather lofty ambitions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so going forward, uh, the uh, Seoul Olympics <coughs> were like a big, not revolution, but you know, there was, right. you know, democracy came out of it and yeah. everything. 
And now that the uh, 2018 Olympics are over, like, how do we think that will impact South Korea? Because I know Seoul is like the main city, but like Pyeongchang is only like, you know, 40 some thousand people in it, and it's smaller and all that. Um, but, you know, there have been like, m there has been more success like uh, in Asian countries in the Winter Olympics. And like, you know, America has Chloe Kim, even mm -hmm. though she's not like, you know, from Korea, she's still, you know, right. Korean heritage. So like, how do you think Asia doing better and, you know, more prominent uh, Korean figures uh, rising? How do you think that will impact, you know, now that the Olympics is over? Yeah, well, there's a question about the, the, the impact the influence for South Korea of these uh, Winter Olympics. And you mentioned two facets that are important. One is the location, because they deliberately located the Winter Olympics in probably the least developed mountain region in the northeast corner of South Korea. Partly they had been neglected largely at the expense of all of the other regions. So it was a very deliberate effort at regional development. Um, and hoping to uh, make these into sort of resort areas, attractive with the transportation. And this may work, you know, we don't know. That's part of the, we, the legacy that, that at least is possible. You know, what it has an impact on the Korean sports world and the sports program. I mean, South Koreans have not been particularly oriented towards you know, a lot of winter sports, but they've acted, the, the Winter Olympics has drawn a number of them into um, outdoor, you know, ski, snowboard uh, sports, but also indoor. I mean, they weren't very successful in ice hockey, but um, perhaps in, in some of the speed skating events, certainly, um, they put a lot of effort. And so the Olympics is a catalyst for many countries to get young athletes tracked into um, certain sports that will then produce the medals that bring national prestige. Um, and that's likely to continue, and particularly because Beijing, China, they want to do well in China in the Winter Olympics. So you can be sure that those Winter Olympic facilities are going to be well used over the next four years to keep those speed skaters and those snowboarders um, up to uh, standards to go into Beijing in four years and do as well as they did in 2018. <clears throat> I was just uh, curious if you could speak very quickly about the various logos of the different Olympics. I've been staring at them as you've been talking uh, and just looking for, well, which ones have things that are identifiably East Asian, like the Beijing logo, and which ones don't. I've also been struck by the contrast between Tokyo 64 with its bold type face yeah. and its identifiable national symbol, and yeah. Tokyo 2020 with its much lighter type face and its geometric puzzle. Yeah. Are there deeper meanings to any of these? Well, I mean, it is fascinating because, I, I mean, Super Bowl, you know, they all create a logo. In the World Series, you all get, you know, the teams come up with the rings. And there's a certain amount of sort of design associated with championships. But the Olympics, beyond all other sports, I mean, actually, until 1948, the Olympics, as you may know, not only were the athletic events, but they had gold, silver, bronze medal competitions in architecture and painting and sculpture and music. They got rid of that in, in 1940, but there was always this pretense that it was the mind and the body and that there was, a, there was an art competition as well as an athletic competition. That went away, but it was really with, with 1964, the rising sun, or it's not rising, it's risen. It's rising above the, uh, the, 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 five, uh, the five rings. I mean, it was boldly announcing itself to the world using its national symbol of the red sun. Um, but also, this was the moment when, when Western design started sort of taking modern Japanese design seriously. And the design, the, 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 the graphic design in Japan in the 1960s was really fabulous. And they used the Olympics. And that kind of set in motion a rivalry ever since to come up with other 
design schemes, not just the logos, but say the posters, the design of the medals, um, all of the signage um, for the, I mean, it's become a complete sort of aesthetic package that cities, countries vie to, to come up with. Right now, Tokyo is enormously anxious because of the huge success that the mascots for Pyeongchang uh, struck with the athletes and the media, I didn't think they were particularly clever, but, but it, apparently they were enormously successful. And so, and the Japanese think they can't come up with mascots that are, that are sort of weak and anemic and not very interesting. And they're all worried about the rivalry between their mascot logos and Pyeongchang. So even, you know, even this has become part of the competitive um, rivalry to produce these sporting, but much more than sporting event. <laughs> yeah, the Pyeongchang uh, <coughs> symbol is, is Hangul. You could interpret that as Hangul. Yeah. Pyeongchang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.